Okay. Um, well, happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. Some of you already he risen indeed. Some of you already beat me to it this morning. I was trying to save it. Spoiled it. <laughs> some of you have some pretty nice colors on. You look like a bunch of Easter eggs in a carton. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with prayer, then we'll jump into uh, the lesson for today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful Resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to the cross to be crucified and bleed for our sins, and then even more so for resurrecting him three days later, almost 2,000 years ago, so we have hope in our own resurrection so that one day we may live eternally with you by your grace, through our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, so, new book starting today. We'll talk more about that here with the intro. Alpha and Omega, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. The timing just happened to be awesome with Resurrection Sunday. So, quick recap of last week, because believe it or not, it, it does have something to do with our lesson today, as it turns out. We covered the Tower of Babel. And under the influence of Satan, we learn that humanity at this time in human history, after the flood, united to become like God. Under the influence of Satan, humanity wanted to become self-reliant apart from God. And under the influence of Satan, humanity used technology to try and make these ambitions of theirs a reality by building a city and a tower. But if you take it deeper, and that's where it's going to connect with uh, today's lesson, you learn that what they are really trying to do is create a heaven on earth under the rule of man, but unbeknownst to them, under the rule of Satan. And to withstand another judgment that they perceive that might come upon them by God in a flood of a, uh, form of a flood again, and thereby, by overpowering God, so to speak, by withstanding any judgment that might come upon them, they will become eternal themselves, reach eternal consciousness. Now, then the word, which is, of course, God, Jesus, which again connects to today's lesson, dispersed them by confusing their language, which is poetic. The word confused their language. Okay? And uh, they dispersed from there, and with them, false religion followed. That spirit of Babylon followed the people across the face of the earth, and history repeats itself. Again, another connection to today's lesson. We broke out the whiteboard. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. And so today, the Bible tells us there are many antichrists at work in the shadows, preparing the way for Babylon the Great and the beast, the antichrist, the antichrist. Now, this concluded our primeval portion of Genesis. That is Genesis 1 through 11. Then we have this break, and it transitions more into patriarchal history. We talked about this when we first started Genesis way back. Patriarchal history of Genesis, now focusing on the lineage of Judaism okay, and the Israelites. Now, our underlying topic from the very beginning of Genesis, why we went from Revelation to Genesis, is because our underlying topic was the end will be like the beginning. We're going to transition now from the primeval history. Instead of going into patriarchal history, we're going to go into John and look at it through a lens of the Alpha and Omega, who Jesus is. He is the beginning and the end. Okay? Um, then we'll probably go to the book of Job because there's a lot of beginning in there with creation. Some people, some theologians even say that Job is more about creation than Genesis in a way. But then I would like to return to Genesis and finish that out sometime after that. So if those of you have OCD, <laughs> obsessive compulsive disorder, you're like, we got to finish the book. We will. <laughs> Jesus might return before then, but we will, okay? Because there are things I like to do. I like to get into some of the epistles and eventually back to... Revelation after some of the Old Testament prophets. But that's really deep stuff. So, the Gospel of John. It's what evangelists, uh, evangelists like to use to give to new believers. They, they point them towards the Gospel of John. I've done that. I'm sure a lot of you have done that. What book of the Bible should I read first? Usually we point them to John. Okay, Some Luke or Mark, whatever. But uh, That's because John is the simplest of the Gospels, okay, for new believers. But also, John is the deepest as well. 
It's the simplest, but it's also the deepest, which is very interesting. And I'm, it looks like most of you here have walked with Jesus longer than I have, okay? So you probably know the Gospel of John pretty well. My, I'm, I pray that every lesson we have in John, everyone learns something new. I'm definitely learning new things, okay? So we'll be taking the Gospel of John pretty deep, just like we took Genesis. So John is the simplest form of the Bible, but it's also the deepest. You see this? All right. John takes place during a new beginning, and the first chapters are considered a midrash or a commentary of the first chapters of Genesis, okay? You can look at the first few chapters of John as a commentary on the first few chapters of Genesis. And if you don't know, that will become pretty evident to you in the first few verses of Genesis. That word midrash, you might have heard of it, you might have not. It's Hebrew. We'll talk more about that later, okay? John is a new beginning. So you have Genesis and Revelation. The end will be like the beginning, but you also have a beginning with, with Jesus coming onto the earth. So... When we started in Genesis, we, we equated Genesis and Revelation about how, you know, you have a tree of life in Genesis. You also have a tree of life in Revelation. Well, the same thing applies with John. John is like included in, in those two books. So it's like three books like that. So in Genesis and John, you have the spirit and water playing key roles in the new creation. Okay. In Genesis, you have um, not only waters with the first few verses of Genesis and God creating the earth, but also, as we discussed, with Noah and cleansing the earth and making it new in that regard. Well, in, in John, and when Jesus is on the earth, he talks to Nicodemus about you must be born again by spirit, by uh, water and spirit. And in Genesis, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit was hovering on, on the face of the waters, okay? Also, in the two books, you have light being separated from darkness, all right? There's a greater light and a lesser light. In Genesis, there's the sun and the moon. In John, there's John the Baptist being the lesser light, and there's Jesus being the greater light. And we'll talk about that today. In both books, you have God walking on the earth, in the garden, and in Jesus. And then in both books, you have God beginning his plan for humanity with the wedding. You have Adam and Eve, husband and wife, in Genesis, and in John, uh, Jesus starts his ministry with the wedding at Cana, where he does his first miracle. He does the miracle with separating or uh, turning the water into wine on the third day of the wedding. And on the third day of creation, God separates the waters, right? Or he, he forms the seas, okay? So there's a parallelism going on there. So just like we did with Genesis, we're going to do a, a brief slide, a single slide on, uh, on what John's about the context of the book of the Gospel of John. So the author is John the Apostle, likely written around 90 AD. That's the consensus of theologians, 90 AD. And he actually tells us the purpose of the book at, toward the end of the book of John in chapter 20. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that's the purpose for the Gospel of John. But uh, also, should be said that unlike the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John is not written as a chronological narrative. It's not written focused on what Jesus did day by day so much, okay? Um, it's written to display the deity of Jesus, who he is as God, more than what he did as a man, okay? Unlike the three synoptic Gospels. And he wrote John to strengthen the faith of second generation believers and correct false teaching of his day. And there was a lot of it going around that said Jesus was a man who inherited the Christ spirit upon his baptism, which then left him at the crucifixion. OK, a lot of Gnosticism and stuff like that sort of creeping in the church, especially after John passed away. Uh, there were always a faithful remnant, but man, false teaching really got into the church after John left. OK. So application, how we can use John to enhance our lives. People thirst for something beyond themselves. Everyone does. Possessing what's become commonly known as a God-shaped hole in the heart. Ecclesiastes 3.11 writes, God has put eternity in the man's heart. So that's why. 
It's a bone deep longing we often try to fill with material and ephemeral pleasures, that thing, but things that leave us feeling empty and wanting more in the end. We thirst for a relationship with our Creator. We thirst for, a deeper, for deeper meaning to our lives. Jesus is that deeper meaning. He is the I am. He is the light of the world, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the door to heaven, the resurrection and the life, the true vine and the way, the truth and the life. Those are the seven I am statements from, of Jesus in John's gospel here. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37, If anyone thirsts, let, let him come to me and drink. There is life in his name, eternal life that will sustain us forever, and life for today that will refresh and renew us in the middle of our journey. Okay. John gets pretty deep, and we're going to go deep. Yes. Yeah, June. Something that really disturbs me is that the President of the United States said that today is a transgender, transgender celebration Sunday. Yeah. And all of this is yep. trash con considering yep. that. Yep. And that I'm, I mean, it's, uh, I would disagree with that on a different time, but to put Transgenders are more important than Jesus. There's, That's a bad president. There's a reason for it, and we'll talk about that today. Okay, we'll talk about that later. It's not a good reason. It's an evil reason, but there is a reason. Okay, so John chapter 1, 1 through 18. Again, these first few chapters are, are very deep especially, so we'll be spending more time on them, and hopefully like Genesis, it'll start to spread out more. But here we go, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came, bear, came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He, was, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Okay. Verse by verse here. Some, some will take a couple verses at a time. So the first three verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Again, the first, uh, entire first chapter of John elaborates on the incarnation of Christ as God more than any other passage in the Bible, so it goes pretty deep. But here, right out of the gate, John is paralleling the creation narrative that we went over together of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But here for the word, word is the word, the Greek word, logos. I'm sure most of you have probably heard the word logos before. So we're going to be spending some time going pretty deep into that word. The word logos stems from a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus, first used around 600 B.C., to designate the divine reason, the divine reason or plan, or you could call it the mind of God, which coordinates a changing universe, which is involved in ordering a changing universe in this physical universe that involves time because with time you get change, with change you get time. Okay, an overarching mind of God, Logos. But generally speaking, Greek philosophers define Logos as the power that brings sense and perfect order to the world, the ultimate reason that controlled all things, okay? The ultimate reason. So I guess the one thing you could take away from Logos is this overarching, all-powerful 
mind that is responsible for maintaining the universe it created, okay? So John obviously paralleling Genesis 1-1, but also likely uh, inspired through the Holy Spirit to use other parts of the Bible which were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Like Psalm 33-6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. And Zechariah 12.1, The oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man with him. Again, the word, Logos, being equated to the creation of all things. Paul himself, who again was inspired through the Holy Spirit, wrote about Jesus in a similar manner concerning his role as a creator, or as creator. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rules, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. All right. Even though the Bible, written by more than 40 authors, all inspired by the same Spirit. So they're saying the same thing in different ways. It's very awesome. Even though maybe they're th or written you know, thousands of years apart. So the Word never began to exist. We can take that just like in the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning was God. Uh, Elohim, of course, being... The Trinity, the plural gods, because in plural, form of God. In the beginning here was the Word. The Logos never began to exist because it was there in the beginning. That's what John's getting at right from the get-go. If you think back to the cosmological argument that we talked about, the cosmological argument or the Kalam cosmo cosmological argument says that anything that begins to exist must have a cause. That's cause and effect. The universe began to exist, secularists would say by a Big Bang, we say by God creating it. Therefore, because the universe began to exist, it must have a cause. Jesus is that cause. God is that cause. All right? Secularists are stumped. They don't know what caused the creating of the universe, but we do because we know the Bible. Now, they might say, well, who created God? Well, that's the thing. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. God was there before the beginning. He doesn't have a cause. Okay? It all makes logical, rational sense. Okay? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the I Am, Yahweh, which means He is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anything else or anyone else. He was there from the very beginning. He has no cause. We do. Again, we discussed this in our study of Genesis 1-1, that God the Son is the agent. God, God the Son, Jesus, is the agent through whom the Father, through whom the Father created and maintains the universe. Through Jesus, God the Father offers salvation. And through Jesus, God gives divine revelation. That's what the Word is, right? Jesus is the Word. He is the Logos. The man God through, through whom God communi communicates who He is to us. How would an almighty, all-powerful, overarching mind of the entire created universe reach those He, he created that are much lesser, restrained by physical barriers and three-dimensional or four-dimensional time? He comes to earth as a, as a man himself, the God-man, Jesus, to communicate who he is. Jesus is God. Boyce said that everything that can be said about God the Father can be said about God the Son. In Jesus dwells all the wisdom, glory, power, love, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Three in one. In him, God the Father is known. Now, Either underline that, circle that, highlight that, because we're going to come back to that at the very end of our lesson today with the last slide. Okay? Next couple verses here, 4 through 5. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay. Again, John, the, the Gospel of John is the simplest book to read and get a basic understanding of who Jesus was or is as God, but it's also the deepest. And we're now starting to see that deepness already. Okay? So, the Greek word used for life in the New Testament, there are three of them. Three. That many. All right. First one, bios, where we get our word biology from, meaning biological life. Life in the physical body and the physical universe. Your body. Biology. Bios. 
If you want an example, check out Luke 8.14. The Greek word they use in that verse for life is bios. Another word they use is uh, suke, meaning soul life. It's where we get our word psychology, psyche, all right? <clears throat> Psychological life of the human soul. In other words, your mind, okay? And then the third form of life in the Greek is zoe, meaning uncreated, eternal life of God, divine life uniquely possessed by God. And that's the form of God or the form of uh, life that's used in this verse. In him was zoe, and the zoe was the light of men, was divine life possessed uniquely by God. All right. Continuing on with this verse. So in Jesus is the key to eternal life because Jesus is life. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. The, the zoe, zoe is actually used for this form of life as well. I am the zoe, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the, word, the Greek word for light is phos, all right? Where we get photon, which are light particles here in our physical universe, all right? Phos, which does literally mean illumination, light like we have in this room right now, phos, okay? But if you look into the Greek where there's also not just a physical definition, but a spiritual definition attached to this word. And it's a metaphorical means, uh, metaphorically means truth and it's knowledge with spiritual purity associated with it. So you have two different definitions with the single word. You have the physical illumination and you have the spiritual truth. All right? So... There's a literal and symbolic meaning to it. You could call it a physical and spiritual meaning. Ramashaw and Nimshaw. Let's talk about that here for a second. So the Tower of Babel that we went over last week, we looked at it from two different lenses. From a physical lens, if you remember back, and a spiritual lens. Now I told you this stems from Greek word or uh, Hebraic words. I just couldn't think of at the time, but I just so happened to come across them again this week. And that's uh, Mashaw and Nimshaw. Okay. So in our intro, I briefly discussed the Midrash, how the book of John is a commentary on the, the first few chapters of John are a commentary on the first few chapters of Gen Genesis, a Midrash. All right, here's, your, here's the thing that most of you will probably learn today, okay? Midrash has two different meanings, okay? Midrash was used by rabbis after jesus had already been crucified and, and resurrected hundreds of years and that's these rabbis used midrash this, this commentary to interpret the old the old testament and they came up with the midrash which is which is a commentary and that's how the the jews that we have in the world today talmudic judaism got the talmud right it's because they used the midrash that's how, the midrash is part of the talmudic judaism okay now liberal protestants those holding the liberal theology Look at the Midrash, this commentary that these rabbis after Jesus put together, and they say, look, they used uh, their own interpretation of Old Testament, so we get to do that too. We can interpret the Old Testament and New Testament however we want, and that's how they come up with this liberal theology, okay? Because they're just basing it on their opinions. That's not the Midrash we're talking about today. There's another Midrash. There's the Midrash that was used by Jesus himself and those in the, Old, in the New Testament, like Matthew, because it was used in the Old Testament. Midrash is actually found in the Old Testament. When Jesus told the scribes that he was talking to, you search the scriptures, that word for search is the word rosh. You rosh the scriptures, you search. All right? So Midrash is a commentary that has led to liberal uh, theology and error, but the Midrash that Jesus used is more of a hermeneutic. It is a way to interpret the Old Testament in light of the New. Okay, So that's how we use Midrash, biblically, is we use it as a form of hermeneutic. Now, here in the West, you know, even evangelicals, theologians, will typically stick to like a historical grammar kind of hermeneutic of, of a way of interpreting scripture. And that will give you basically a, an overview of the Bible, but it won't allow you to go deeper as the Bible intends. If you want to go deeper, you have to read the Bible like the Hebrews would, like a Jew would, because the Bible is very Jewish, okay? Maybe there's an asterisk there with Luke and Acts, all right? So, from the Midrash, we get the Pesher and the Peshet, right? 
This is a form of midrash, or a way of exegesis in the midrash, a way to interpret the Bible, all right? Which is where we get Masha and Nimshah. Last week, I brought the whiteboard up here, and I said, you can look at the history, the orientation of human history through three different perspectives. The first one is end to the be or the beginning to the end. That's the Western way of viewing it. The Eastern way is you have a circular. There's no beginning. There's no end. It's just a circle. It's, it's reincarnation. And then the third way, the biblical way to view history, is there is a combination of both. It's there's a beginning, there's an end, but along the way, history repeats itself. All right? That's the pesher right there. That's the way the, old, the New Testament authors would have viewed history. We can see that if we really study Matthew, he does that. Jesus himself uh, interpreted the Old Testament through pesher. Okay? Now in pesher, you have the masha and the nimsha. A parable that Jesus liked to speak of was an elongated form of masha. Masha is basically just the Bible writing something so that we can understand it in our lifetime. We can apply it to our lifetime, right? So a parable of the, the sower, you know, he has the seeds. That is how people in the day of, of Jesus could understand what Jesus was saying. But with the masha comes a nimsha, a deeper spiritual meaning, right? This is why Jesus spoke in parables, so that those who are arrogant, the, the Pharisees, wouldn't understand what he was saying. You had to be humble in order to understand what Jesus was saying. So there was a nimshaw with it, a deeper underlying meaning to it. Okay? And that's how John here is writing, okay? In this kind of form. You can read John, and you'll get a basic understanding of who Jesus is, but there's always a deeper way to go. And there always will be, because Jesus is eternal. Right? Masha and nimshaw. And this is especially seen with prophecy. Right? Especially with prophecy. People will view prophecy in one of four ways. They'll view prophecy as, you know, preterism, where the Bible, prophetic things written in the Bible, written after the prophetic things have already come to pass. That's why they're in the Bible. That's preterism. They'll view prophecy through a historical lens. What was written in the Bible um, has already come to pass after it was written. So 70 AD had already come to pass from Revelation, which is, you know, the end times. But what they don't know is that's actually a... Uh, a foreshadow of the end times of 70 AD. Not all scripture was fulfilled there. A third way is through idealism or po poeticism. You can look at prophecy just as symbolism, okay? Or there's a fourth way. You can look at prophecy through futurism, right? The prophetic things have not come to pass yet. The correct Hebrew way, again, patterns, is to look at all of them and apply all four of them to prophecy. That's how the Hebrews looked at prophecy, okay? And this all stems back to uh, Malshaw, Nimshaw, that's the Pesher, which comes from the Midrash, right? So just keep that in mind because it's going to come up again here in a little bit. Again, John goes very deep. So, the darkness has not overcome the light. <laughs> Speaking of complicated things, the word for overcome is the Greek word katalambo, katalabano, coming from two root words, kata, meaning against or oppose, or labano, meaning to take. So what it means is to lay hold of so as to make one's own. Okay? And you can get two correct interpretations from that, transliterations. You can get from over uh, from kata labano, either comprehend or overcome. Overcome is probably the most accurate way to interpret it, and that's what the ESV uses. But comprehend is, is not wrong either. Okay? So when I was trying to think of a way to put this in e easy ways to understand, I was just led to just, I was led back for some reason to the whole shepherd, sheep, wolf thing. Okay, so this is how I put it. When you include the adverb not, what this conveys to me is the ability of Jesus to reach his lost sheep, which would be believers. So you can imagine Jesus going on, out at night with a flashlight. He doesn't need it because he is a light. So Jesus is a walking glow stick, so to speak. <laughs> And it's dark out, and he's in the woods. He's looking for this lost sheep, and you hear howling, okay? And the wolves are trying to get him. But every time the wolves try to go after Jesus, his light scares him away, okay? Those would be, obviously, the wolves would be Satan and his demons. They can't overpower Jesus because they are of the darkness. They belong in the dark. That's where the wolves hunt. And they scatter from his light. They scatter from the truth. 
again, it goes to that mashal nimshal. You have that physical story that we can apply to our minds, but then you have that you have that nimshal, that deeper meaning of what it's actually getting at. So, Jesus, who alone possesses eternal light, is the light. He is that revelation from God, that communication from God that overcomes this dark, you could call it this blind, sinful, and dying world. This is what John's getting at here. From John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. They will not be blind. They will not have misunderstanding. But will have the light of life. They will have the light of life. They will have understanding of life. They will have eternal life. Therefore, without Jesus, we're all dead to darkness. We're all lost. John writes in axiomatic contrasts, you know, light and darkness, good and evil. So we can just apply a negative to this. Without Jesus, we're all dead to darkness. We're lost. Only the sheep that Jesus is calling out to will hear his voice. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers it, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospels of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Bruce writes. In the first creation, darkness was upon the face of the deep in Genesis 1-2, until God called light into being. So the new creation involves the banishing of spiritual darkness by the light which shines in the world. All right? The darkness does not overcome it. All right? We have the light in us that reflects through us, shining into the dark world that cannot overcome us because the world does not understand. Misunderstanding will never triumph over those who have the truth. John writes that Jesus, who is the Word, is eternal and is God. Further, all creation came about by and through Jesus, who was presented as the source of life itself. He is self-existent. Right? We, we covered that at length uh, during our first go at Genesis 1.1. Right? So, to summarize... Genesis 1 through 5 here. We have learned that Jesus is eternal. Jesus was with God, the Father, prior to coming to earth. Jesus is also the same God as God the Father. Jesus is creator. Jesus is the giver of life. And we'll learn in verse 14 in a few that Jesus became human and that Jesus, who's the light, overcame death. Okay? If you're confused, then just circle that, part, that, that, uh, that slide right there. That basically summarizes it. All right. Next few verses, 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And, you know, I remember when I first read this, I thought, is John talking about himself? Because, you know, John has this reputation of doing that, right? This one, you know, disciple who outran Peter talking about himself. All right. The one who Jesus loved? All right, we get it, John. He never used his own name. Very humble of him. <laughs> he came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So here the author, John, is writing about John the Baptist. You get that, Third John? Where's Third John at? Oh, there's Third John. All right. It's a good thing John Lewis isn't teaching anymore. All right. Like John, all followers of Christ are to reflect the light of Jesus, okay? But John was not the light, okay? Question, first question of the day on your papers. Given our discussion today about light, about phos, and what that, mean, that really means, what does reflecting the light of Jesus mean to you? Like the moon reflecting the sun, we're to reflect the light of Jesus. What does that mean to you? You guys have been walking with Jesus longer than I have, most likely. You should know this. No pressure. <laughs> we are to be examples here on earth. We're to be examples here on earth, right? Yeah. Good. All right, we got an answer. Anybody else want to participate? I don't have any brownies or cookies. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
Think about John the Baptist. John's focus was pointing people to faith in Jesus by preaching repentance and preparing the way for the Messiah through baptism, right? Repent and be baptized. That's what, John, that's what John's mission was. But John was not the light, and we are not the light. But we become the light of the world by allowing Christ to shine through us. Polly, you have Matthew chapter 5 there. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. All right. Don't be selfish and keep the light of Jesus to yourself. And like John the Baptist, Christians are preparing the way for the return of Jesus the Messiah. we got the same mission, right? John the Baptist prepared the way for the first coming of Christ by pre preaching repentance and baptism. And that's exactly what Jesus told us to do. Go and make disciples. We're to prepare the way for the return of Jesus' second coming. Okay? But it's important to note that, um, again, by preaching repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as ambassadors, that this is a spiritual mission, right? This is a spiritual mission. We go out and we try to, you know, tell people about Jesus. We witness to them. And we let the Holy Spirit convert them if, if, if they're to be converted. And then we, we bring them up, you know, through the church and, and we teach them the ways of our Lord so um, they can grow and we can all grow in a deeper faith with Jesus. That's a spiritual mission. Our mission is not a physical one. Our mission is not to conquer the world in the name of Jesus, which appears to be what a lot of people professing faith in Christ seem to take from the scriptures. That would be dominion theology, that would be reconstructionism, that would be theonomy, kingdom now, teaching, which all stems with, it's all connected to post-millennialism. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, it goes back to the Pesher and the Mashal and Nimshal. We have that physical, and we have that spiritual. This is the spiritual mission we are given. All right, yeah, we have to do it in the physical, but what we're trying to do is convert, or we're trying to, to grow people spiritually, to prepare the way for Jesus. What Dominion Theology and Kingdom Now teach is they're trying to physically conquer the world like the Crusades. Think of the Crusades in the name of Jesus. Some of them will even get violent to do it, which flies in the face of the Beatitudes, right? About being meek, about being peacemakers. Yeah, I'm doing this for Christ. I'm a peacemaker. Stab. All right. <laughs> This is a growing, all right, last week we touched on ecumenism and how the far left church is trying to be one with other faiths and Mormons and Muslims and Roman Catholics, which obviously will lead to the false prophet. Um, but on the opposite side of the coin, on the far right, you have the, like, these Catholics as well and, and others in the Protestantism, Protestantism that are trying to use like Dominion theology and Reconstructionism, supersessionism, and that's where it all stems from, believing that the church has replaced Israel entirely. That's where it all stems from. If someone ever says that they believe in supersessionism, right from the very beginning, that's a litmus test. All the other theology is going to be wrong. Okay, And then we'll lead most of them to post-millennialism. Belief that we're actually, some of them believe that we're living in the millennial reign right now. And then Christ will return. And then the eternal heaven on earth thing. Does it feel like heaven on earth to you right now? <laughs> Jesus said that in the end times, Things will be so bad, they'll never be, you know, compared to again. Well, they'll say that 70 AD was fulfillment of Revelation. Well, since 70 AD, we had the Holocaust. About a million people were killed during 70 AD, 6 million Jews alone, plus another probably 10 million or so during the Holocaust. It's been way worse than 70 AD. And they even had to have, they even had food riots over placentas because they were starving to death. But it's way worse than that still. So it flies in the faith of, actual biblical scripture, these theologies, these beliefs, again, they fly in the face of the Beatitudes, okay? Um, and again, it goes to what Jim was talking about. <laughs> Today is, I guess, according to the government, National Trans Visibility Day, right? As if you couldn't see them before, all right? <laughs> as if they can hide, that's Carrie's joke, as if they have any success at hiding, all right? Does the world feel like it's being conquered for Christ? No. If you still believe in pre, pre or post millennialism at this point, you're 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 willfully blind. You are not in the light. All right. You need to get back in the scriptures. Does that answer some questions? All right. 
Verses 9 through 11. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. That the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So Jesus is the truth. The way, the truth, and life. Jesus is the truth, the true light. We can reflect just like the light. We can reflect the truth like we can reflect the light. But as creator, Jesus is also the source of all truth. He is the source of all light. We can speak truthful things. Even unbelievers can speak truthful things, right? But he is the truth. Now, if you're thinking, man, it just it's so hard to fathom that this, this Logos, this almighty creator could come down to earth in, in human form. Like, wow, it's really not that hard to believe if you really meditate on it and constantly pray about it. It makes sense that God, who's big enough and powerful enough to create the world, could also be powerful enough to bring himself into the world he created, right? It's kind of like you guys don't really look like video gamers, right? <laughs> but you have, for any youth that might watch this video, all right? My grandma liked to play Tetris, okay? You don't know? <laughs> it's like you have this video game developer making this world in this video game. How hard is it for him to make a character and start playing the game, <laughs> okay? So you can think of it that way if you want. But notice that John uses the word everyone. He gives light to everyone. That's everyone. Everyone means everyone. Like all means all, and that's all that all means. Everyone means even unbelievers. Everyone is made in the image of God, even if you don't believe in him, and receives common grace, the ability to live at all in the first place. You have grace through God because you can still breathe. He doesn't suffocate you, okay? Air comes from God. It, common grace is the ability to live at all, but also to live with any kind of truth, love, care, or goodness, all right? might not be agape love, there's a form of love there. It's love based on feeling. That's still grace that keeps us from shredding each other apart out of hate. Everyone, all, all unbelievers are given the chance to receive the light of Jesus Christ <clears throat> as their creator. Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown, to, shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are, not, or so they are without excuse. So all unbelievers are given a chance to receive the truth. Now, it's specified in, in that passage, and in, right here, unbelievers, and those who did not believe, willfully did not believe, there are people like kids that don't have that ability. There are people with mental handicaps that don't have, they get a golden ticket, man. You're good, all right? But the world is under darkness, and even the Jews try to put out the light of Jesus by crucifying him through the Romans, okay? He came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own people did not receive him, okay? Also, by the way, this is why a lot of supersessionists who believe the church replaced Israel, there's some anti-Semitism there. They hold a pretty big grudge that the Jews crucified the Messiah, or they would say the Christ. The Christ. thing is, the Romans crucified him too, all right? Gentiles crucified him too. We all did. We all did. If you sin, you put him up there. Mm -hmm. So as believers, we join him up there. We are crucified with Christ. We no longer live for ourselves. So, another way to put this, those who do receive the light, the revelation from God that Jesus is the truth, they believe the truth about the darkness that is in them, they believe that they are sinners, those who receive this communication from God, that they are sinful, and that the blood of Jesus atoned for it, right? And so they place their trust, belief plus trust equals faith, they place their trust, their faith in Jesus alone for their salvation to become God's children. God's children, born of God, born again. Not by human effort or achievement, but by the grace of God through faith. Okay. John 14, 1 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So again, amazingly, the Logos, this divine, all powering, mind of God, God humbled himself to come among us. First John, his first epistle, 
that which was from the beginning, we have heard, which we have heard, which we have seen with our, 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 our eyes, which we looked upon and have even touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Jesus became flesh. Again, it makes sense that God could do this, that could become a man. But notice that John writes, he dwelt among us. He didn't write he, he was of the world or he was like the world. He was among the world. Okay, Again, like followers or, or like the light of Christ, the, we reflect the light of Christ. We are followers of Christ. We are also to live in or among the world, but not of it or like it. Not of the world or like the world, but in the world as Jesus was in the world. Uh, Paula, you have John 17. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay? When the Bible uses the world, what it refers to as Satan's world, the fallen world, sinful world. We are not to put our trust, our faith, we're not to put anything in place of or above Christ. Right? Christ comes first. Because we are not of the world. We are just in the world as his ambassadors. So God the Son became the fleshy manifestation of God in the dwelling place of God's glory. Glory, the state of the highest honor and very essence of God's being. John 14, 9. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, I have been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Okay, Jesus is the fleshly, fleshy manifestation of God the Father, of God. And it dwelt among us, dwelling, dwelling place, dwelling, tabernacle, glory. I underline tabernacle because the Greek word uh, for fleshy and the Hebraic word for tabernacle, they're, they're actually, the way John writes it, they're related, right? Uh, so you could kind of say the word became a tabernacle again. And the glory in the Old Testament all referred to God taking up residence in the temple. That Shekinah glory, the Israelites in the wilderness being led by the, the, the pillaring smoke during the day and the pillar of fire at night, that Shekinah glory that made Moses radiate when he came down from the Mount of Sinai, right? Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Hebrews 1, 3, He is the radiance, Jesus is the radiance of that glory of God, of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. By, you could say by Jesus. Jesus is the power of God. So God came down to us because he seeks a relationship with us. And that's not religion. Religion is man seeking God. Christianity is God seeking us. All right? We do not have a religion. Even, even scientism, secularism, atheism, it's all religion. We're trying to... Find out how all this was created and started through science. All right, well, you have a religion. You're seeking the Creator. While John saw God's Shekinah glory, both in the Old Testament and in Jesus, um, it was veiled, okay? Um, obviously, the glory of God was veiled when Moses asked to see God's glory in the wilderness. God put him in the cleft of the rock, uh, covered him with his hand, and only allowed him to see the back of him. Uh, but even in Jesus, the glory of God was veiled to an extent. Don't let that shock you, okay? We'll talk about that. But that will no longer be the case when we get to heaven and we get to see God face to face. Uh, Paul, you have 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. As he is. Jesus is everything God is, he, but we can only see so much of it, okay? In the meantime, before we have our resurrected bodies and the rapture and we're spending eternity with God face to face, before that happens, in the meantime, Christ dealt, dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we are now God's temple, all right? We are God's temple now. Jesus, the Son, the only Son from the Father, He was sent from the Father. You could say that we are saved Saved by His grace through faith in the truth because Jesus is the truth. You can say we are saved by the grace of God through faith in God because Jesus is the one true God. And you can say we are saved by Jesus Christ, who is full of both grace and truth. 
Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. All right, so John bore witness about him and cried out. This is John the Baptist speaking. This Jesus was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. So although John the Baptist was preparing the way for Jesus, the Messiah, to come, he publicly acknowledges here that Jesus is greater than himself because he understood the pre-existence of Jesus, who Jesus was. He was God. He was God in the beginning. Okay. Now, again, to go deeper, in antiquity, in the time of Jesus and John the Baptist, it was held by the generations that their previous generations that came before them were held in higher esteem. They're they're seen as wiser. All right, you boomers. Okay. <laughs> so, so like it's not like our day where you know the youth disrespect their elders, right, boomers? Okay. <laughs> They thought of the generations before them as wiser, okay? But here, John is kind of reversing that in his humility. He's saying, the one that comes after me, who's, who's going to come take the center stage that I'm on, he's actually greater. He highlights his own inferiority, right? It's that humility, that same humility that Jesus had when he came in the form of Jesus or in, in man. And John the Baptist will even say later in this gospel that Jesus must increase and he must decrease. And that both means in a physical sense and in a a spiritual sense. Physically, Jesus must have a bigger following and and John must now go to the shadows a a bit. Okay, But spiritually, that also means, and for us, in our own lives, we must be crucified with Christ. We must allow Christ to work through us. We, in our selfishness and our pride, have to now go away. Right? Jesus must increase and we must decrease. All right, home stretch. Last few verses. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So in contrast to the rigid law given through Moses, the life of Jesus provided an inexhaustible supply of grace. Grace upon grace, never ending, but also truth. Now, I like how Morris points out, because if you do look into this word upon In the Greek, it actually doesn't mean like, or uh, it doesn't actually mean upon, it means instead of. So it literally means grace instead of grace. So clearly John intends to put some emphasis on the thought of grace because he keeps using it, right? The more things are in the Bible, the more important they are. So he probably also means that as one piece of divine grace through the Old Testament law, God was graceful enough to give the Jews a law, right? Even though it was impossible to keep, there's a reason for that even though you have the end of that divine grace or the receding of it, it is replaced by God through his grace with more grace. God's grace to his people is continuous, is never exhausted. Grace knows no interruption and no limit. The grace of the Old Testament, even though it's not really it's impossible to keep, goes away and Jesus is on the scene and gets crucified. Now we have more grace. So Old Testament law has its place. It was in part used as a teaching method. We talked about that at length, that God's a teacher since the very beginning of creation, separating light from darkness and all that is a teachable moment. He knew what was going to happen. So he's getting ahead of the ball, ahead of the curve here. It was, it was used as a teaching method that nobody can keep the law. And in case you didn't know, it will be used again in the same manner for those born during the millennial reign of Christ. I just threw that in there as a little Easter egg for Easter. Also, as a foreshadow, the Old Testament was used. The Old Testament law was used as a foreshadow of what was about to, uh, about what what God was about to do through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, right? And then the millennium, it will be used as a shadow, not a foreshadow, but a shadow of what Jesus did do for those who were born during the millennial reign. In case you didn't know, this is something I learned in the past, like year or so, in Ezekiel and other, like Isaiah, there will be sacrifices in a temple again during the millennial reign of Christ. And you'd be like, what? Jesus is going to be the, why is that? And it's because there's going to be people born that just, because Satan will be bound, there'll be no way for them to really understand. So it'll be used as a teaching method of what Jesus did do. So John seems to really stress the reality of that both grace and truth are important subjects to look at while investigating who Jesus Christ is. So as his ambassadors, what we can learn from this and take from this and use for our own lives here in the physical is we cannot pick and choose which one to use for witnessing to unbelievers. We must be both graceful and truthful. We must speak with grace while not shying away one inch from the truth. That's what the ecumenical movement does. They're all about the grace part. 
but they're, they don't, they don't speak the truth. And the thing is, they're not really about the grace either, because in order to have grace, you have to admit you're a sinner, right? And the ecumenical movement doesn't want that. They just want to teach about Jesus and let Jesus handle it. Well, that's not what, that's not what John the Baptist did. That's not what the apostles did. You have to pe preach repentance. Okay. Last verse here. No one has ever seen God, but the, uh, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So nobody alive can see God in all his unveiled glory, total glory, not veiled at all, not hidden at all, face to face, if you want to put it that way, because if they, if they did, they would die in their sinful flesh, just like God told Moses. If you look upon me face to face, you will surely die. Some more examples of people who did see some, just some of God's glory and thought they would die. They fell down on their faces and said, oh, I'm going to perish. All right, you can check out those verses, okay? And we spoke about this like in our first lesson together, our first prelude. This, the reason why is because God is holy and cannot look upon sin with favor, okay? If, God, if all of God's glory was to look upon sin or however you want to put it, because we're talking about spiritual now, mixed with sin, he'd have to destroy it. He'd have to destroy the sin. He can't be not, cannot be yoked with sin in that regard. But Jesus is the Word of God, and Jesus is God. He is the perfect declaration of the unseen God. Genesis 14, we talked about this already. So the question becomes, and this is what was in the email and in your papers, since Jesus is God, and yet we're told God cannot be seen, His face cannot be seen, or you'll die, how did Jesus not wipe out the entire Middle East like with a nuclear explosion with His face? <laughs> how come like no one, on any of the apostles or anyone who saw Jesus you know, the people we healed, why didn't they die? Jesus is God, right? He's all of God, we're told. Fully human. Yeah, he's also fully human, right? So, though Jesus is the truth, he is also eternal and infinite. Jesus is alive right now in eternity. That's where he ascended to. But yet we are not, right? We are not. We are not. We will live forever, those of us that are in Christ, but we are not eternal and self-existent like God is, which is why heaven and heaven on earth is, uh, well, I'll get into that another day, never mind. Which means that there will always be more we can learn about the truth, more to learn about him. Okay, I guess I got to get there. Heaven, what will make heaven so awesome is that you're always going to learn. You're always going to learn more about who God is. A lot of Christians have this belief that once you get into heaven, you're going to be like God, you're going to know everything. That's not the case because we're not eternal like God is. He's the only one that's omnipresent, omnipotent, and all that stuff. We are his creation. Although everything we will see and understand about God will be the truth, there will always be more to learn. All right. Um, John 21, 25. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And I think the next one actually explains this a lot better. So we live in a physical universe, right? Three dimensions, four dimensions, if you use time. We are constrained in some way. God is not, right? So if God is to become a person like us, he's restrained in some way. And I think Philippians 2, 5 explains that the best, okay? Um, about why that is and how that came to be. 5 through 8, chapter 2, 5 through 8. About Jesus. Having this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Okay? So Jesus is all of God, but in a way for us, in this physical world we live in, he's veiled to us, even though all of him, all of them can actually be seen for us. It can't be like it's, that's, it's the whole story of the mountain transfiguration, right? The whole time Jesus would be radiating, but we can't see it. They go up on the mountain transfiguration. And now they're seeing who uh, they're still seeing a veiled portion of who Jesus is. But now he's like, like a really shaking glow stick. Okay. But the grace and truth that was provided to us in the word, Jesus Christ is enough to make the unseen God known to us so that all who place their faith in Christ will forever continue to come into a deeper relationship with God. Check out Matthew 17, 1 through 8.
but we are out of time. That is the mountain of transfiguration there. Yeah, Kent. Look at Mary Magdalene seeing at the tomb of Jesus. When she thought she was seeing the gardener? <laughs> um, she also was seen in the upper room. When, when Jesus walked through the locked door? Yeah, that was Jesus. It was Jesus, but again, like you're getting at, I think, it was veiled to them. They didn't, their, maybe their eyes weren't open to or they just weren't paying attention. They didn't die, <laughs> they didn't die no. Yeah. It wasn't an angel? No. No, this is after his uh, resurrection, yeah. Yeah, all right. Anybody else? Yeah, Bill. Summary or Bill. of all Jim. this for me. John 3.30. Okay. He must increase. increase, but I must decrease. Yep. That's grasping all this truth about who Jesus and God is. And what my responsibility is, is to reflect his glory to the unbelieving world. That's right. That's our purpose, right? That's our purpose as Christians. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, this lesson that you've given us. Uh, bless it to our, our spirits, our souls, our minds, so that we can bless others all to your glory. Um, keep us safe this Resurrection Sunday, and keep our minds on what your Son Jesus did for us so that we can live in eternity with you face to face in all your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, guys.